Okay. Oh, okay. Yep. Department seminar. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome everybody to our February Science Education Department seminar. We're happy that you're all here today and we're excited to have Dr. Nanette Sherry Schoenlieber here with us today. So Dr. Schoenlieber received her doctoral degree in educational psychology from the University of Hawaii at Manoa and her master's degree in early childhood education from the Shamanad University of Honolulu. Her research interests focus on the intersection of pedagogy, learning, and cultural language as a means of achieving uh, social justice, equity, and access to the sciences and the natural for the underserved children and the adults. She's currently investigating preschool teachers' perceptions of the use of a unique set of pedagogical tools designed to increase access to the natural world and the sciences for the underrepresented young children and the adults in their lives. So I first came across Sherry's work on teaching science in Hawaii because of my own connection with the Hawaiian land and culture, having lived there for the most of my adult life. I found out that our path actually crossed because we both went to the same program at UH Manoa, and I was fascinated by her research and work with the indigenous educators. I'm really excited about her talk today. So in today's talk, she will share the story of a qualitative study designed to discover how and why a group of Hawaiian language immersion educators adopted a culturally responsive curriculum to support children's science learning. I think it's relevant to what we do here at the center in terms of making connections with the local community. So it is my honor to have her today. Mahalo Sherry again for sharing your work about the culturally based science education. So a couple of uh, things to remind everybody for today's presentation, feel free to post questions in the chat or use the raise hand feature. We'll have time for questions at the end. Um, we also ask if possible uh, in the Zoom, the audience, please leave your cameras on for the presentation. Uh, okay, so without further ado, uh, I will hand it over to you, Sherry. Take away. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for having me here today. It's really fun. Um, I'm really appreciative that you're interested in this work. It's a small piece of a really large uh, country. Um, so yeah, I, um, I'm i just gonna get started. I'm talk this, titling this Walking in Both Worlds, Creating a Science Curriculum for Hawaiian Language Immersion Students in a Public Charter School in Hawaii. Um, this is a study that took place in 2008, 2009. Um, I did a retrospective a uh, few years later and um, it was pretty, pretty fun and pretty, I would say, pivotal for me in my own work. I'm going to talk today about my initial experiences with working with Hawaiian language immersion, first as students in my own uh, university, and then what the initial study that led to the work I did with the Samuel M. Kamakau Hawaiian Language Public Charter Laboratory School. Okay. What happened is I had a perfect laboratory experience by accident. I was working at a small university in Honolulu. We had the only master's degree program in the state in early childhood education. In the mid nineties, a lot of students started coming out of the Hawaiian language, Hawaiian language um, majors and having to do practicing of their Hawaiian language in the Hawaiian language immersion preschools that had been started about 10 years before. So they were going to preschools to practice their Hawaiian, and some of them got hooked into wanting to become early childhood teachers. And then I had the only game in town in terms of a master's program in early childhood. So a lot of the Hawaiian language immersion students, people who wanted to work in preschools, came to our master's program. I was teaching Montessori at that time. And people, anybody could take the classes, but basically it was like it, the flavor you got was Montessori. So, um, and, and people either, I had Montessori students who liked it, who expected it. I had students who were not from Montessori preschools or early learning programs. And they were like, okay, this is interesting, but probably not gonna use a lot of the methods. What happened is the Hawaiian language immersion students would come up to me after class and say, we see this, we see this as congruent with what our um, wise sayings say we should be doing. And we see this congruent with what our kumu, our elders used to talk about. And I had one describe it to me as they saw 
what I was teaching as a bridge from the past to the future for them. So I became very curious because Montessori, as you might know, was working in the early 1900s and she's from Italy. And it's like, how could that, I'm like, how can this be? How can Hawaiian language immersion people who are trying to bring back, restore, keep alive a culture that is indigenous, how could they think what Montessori did was even close to what they're looking for? So I did my doctoral research on that. I read uh, all of Montessori's works that I could get my hands on. And I, um, I can you see this full screen? I'm not sure if it's, uh, the, okay. So, and, and I just a quick quote from her. She said, people talk about the Montessori method, but I must tell you it is not exactly a method. This is a name applied by the Americans to our system in their desire to simplify things. That which I have divulged is on the whole, a conjunction of observations obtained from having devoted myself for many years to studying both the body and soul of children. Montessori was one of the first two uh, physicians in the state, in the newly formed state of Italy. And she discovered quickly that she wanted to know more about how children learned. And that was her life's work for about 50 or 60 years. And so the Montessori approach is based on her observations. As a physician, she had been trained to observe and then diagnose and then prescribe. And that's basically how she came up with her method. The traditions and major aspects of focus is on universals. The teacher is considered to be a guide and observer. The, what she called the prepared environment is designed to meet the needs of children. There's a strong emphasis on the outdoors and the need for nature and the natural world. Um, the idea is that children have special qualities and characteristics that we that adults need to attend to. And she had this idea that there were guiding forces underlying development. Okay, remembering that she came was coming out of the enlightenment and the uh, scientific revolution. What was happening then is I was seeing my students who had to do a year long internship. This was a, a student working in a Hawaiian language immersion preschool. You can see here that these are Hawaiian names, but using Montessori strategies to teach in the classroom. This, and they were doing such a good job that this guy in particular, Kaipu'i, I said, if you would like to go for your Montessori credential, you may. And he said to me something I'll never forget. He said, I am a, I am a Hawaiian language immersion teacher. I like this, but that's not who I am. They wanted the knowledge. They did not want to become Montessorians. Okay, so I saw this as kind of this kind of intersection of paradigms that I didn't really understand. So the study, I had 15 of my former students, a couple of actually that weren't former students, 25 who had no Montessori training. Um, they were either Hawaiian or part Hawaiian. Most of these guys who were Montessori trained were Hawaiian, spoke Hawaiian because they were forming the uh, Hawaiian language immersion programs. 19 of these 25 spoke some Hawaiian. What I found were four key similarities, some distinction that I noticed that the teachers did not notice and some of their challenges. I'm gonna to focus today on the four similarities. So the, there, what, what, what came together from it was a grounded theory uh, of uh, methods was First, this kind of way of living that they identified in the same way that Montessorians identify that this was not just a way of teaching, it was a way of life. They identified very deeply as being language immersion teachers as a way of life. It, it also is a way of teaching. There are 10 strategies that I found that overlapped that are similar in both Montessori and um, the Hawaiian language, what the Hawaiians were looking for from their wise sayings. Um, there were seven values or beliefs that the two um, ways of, of teaching uh, um, shared in common. This was coming from my readings of Montessori and what I learned in the interviews and the focus groups that I did with the 35, 40 um, people. And that way of believing has underneath it, and this is the key for me, this was like the grounded, kind of explained everything else, this way of knowing about the world 
a way of understanding the world that cannot be, it's a presupposition about how the world works. It cannot be proved. And so let, let's just take a look at these a little more deeply. This was the first way I was able to conceptualize this. So there was these three kind of beliefs you can't prove. One is the idea that children are spiritual in their essence. Montessori talked about the spiritual embryo. The Hawaiians very deeply believe that there's something inside you, manao, that is who you are in your essence. And that as teachers, we need to both believe that as teachers, we need to start there with our focus. Okay, The idea that we're all interconnected. As I saw that you're part of the astrophysics, like something. And so I was thinking, oh, maybe because people either understand this or they don't. This idea that everything in the universe is connected in some way. Okay, and that was common to Montessori. She talks about it, she writes about it, and the Hawaiians deeply believe that everything is interconnected. And then the final thing, which is a place I can't even really get to, but it's the idea that the earth is not only sacred, but the earth is a living entity. Montessori wrote about that too, which is very surprising to me. And the must, the, the Hawaiians, it's a very deep belief that the aina, the earth, is living and to be cared for. Okay. You can't, I don't know if you can prove that the earth is living. That's what I'm saying. These are presuppositions. From those emerge these seven values. The teacher is a guide because the child, we can only be guides because we're here to support this spiritual, this beings unfolding. As they unfold to their best sense, the Hawaiians believe that they then bring up the entire community. So it's important to make sure that people reach their full potential because then the whole community is uplifted. Okay, so I'm not gonna go into the responsibilities, work and freedom, community responsibility, education as transformative, aesthetics, beauty, order and closure was very interesting. Um, and this idea of valuing nature and things of nature. And then all these leaves are what came out of those which are ways of teaching. So there are about 10 ways of teaching. I'm only gonna highlight one now. So a way of living, kind of being drawn into this thing, whether you wanted to or not, was common. This is what one of my, um, the people I interviewed, I I'm gonna just read the last part. She talked about the life-changing experience of knowing Hawaii for what it really is, or as close as I can come to knowing it, being that I'm not native. This is what drove them to wanna to create their own curriculum in the sciences because their kids were not feeling like, I wanna grow up and be a scientist. And they wanted that. They wanted their kids to be scientists, to make a difference, having that Hawaiian cultural perspective, that idea that the earth is living, that idea that we're all connected. And then the idea that, And then there were these like 10 overlapping teaching strategies. So there was this way of teaching that came out of the thing that I'm gonna focus on the most here. These were the uh, percentages of people who said self-directed, you had to, kids had to be self-directed. We had to teach in a way that allowed student, children to be self-directed, use of demonstrations, all the way down to storytelling. These were teaching strategies that the Hawaiians saw as shared in common with, with Montessori. Okay. So this is what, what Kapono said. He was not, um, he was a high school teacher. He didn't speak Hawaiian, but he agreed when, when I talked about uh, Montessori, um, that the willingness on the part of adults to allow children to choose their own path. He agreed saying, I think that's the goal of this school too. It's kind of, you know, they have to pick their own path. You teach them the principles and you can let them go. I think that's the best way to go. This was very common. The use of silent demonstration. There's a saying in Hawaiian, which is where they were getting their information about how to teach. I forgot how to say it in Hawaiian, but it's basically listen with the ears, watch with the eyes, shut the mouth. Montessorians teach using silent demonstrations in the early childhood years. So they resonated with that. And one of the participants talked to me about how her dad took her out to like learn, teach her how to throw net um, for catching fish. And she talked about watching him and how it, there was this very spiritual feeling 
being with him, just silently watching and learning in that way. So that was also a very strong value in terms of um, teaching strategies. In terms of values and beliefs about learning, um, these seven were, let me see where you are, where'd you go, seven. Okay. One of the main beliefs was a belief that you had to incorporate the natural world in teaching. 95% of the participants agreed, like came up with that. That's what emerged. Like 95% of them brought that up in the interviews or the talks. Um, the idea of community was also very strong, but I'm gonna focus right now on this because this is what we focused on um, in our, our work. So valuing the natural world. And they, he, they, this is what one of the other key informants, he was one of the ones who was working in a Hawaiian language immersion preschool. And she, she said when she started her training at Montessori, she, she, what I did was pull from our Olelo no Oyao, the wise sayings, the proverbs, because what's obvious to me that what I was learning at Shamanad, that there were specific Olelo no Oyao that matched up to many of the teachings. When you say malama ka'aina, malama ika wahiana, that means take care of the land, take care of your space. So we implemented it. She was talking about the Montessori approach and we found out it worked, it all worked. And then finally, this underlying, um, so I'm going a little fast here, this underlying shared worldview. Children have this spiritual essence, everything in the universe is interconnected and the earth is living. This bottom, uh, picture here is a drawing that I think it was the second and third graders did of a belief about how Kalo uh, Taro is the elder brother of people. And this these are little embryos in the Kalo or the Taro root being coming, being ready to come be born as people on the earth. And any of these are drawings or pictures that the children did. They did this thing called arting with their science curriculum. So Montessori said, all are linked and all have their place and have their place in the universe. The stars, earth, stones, life of all kinds form a whole in relation to one another. And so close is this relation that we cannot understand a stone without some understanding of the great sun. No matter what we touch, an atom or a cell, we cannot explain it without knowledge of the wide universe. What am I? What is the task of people, she wrote him, um, in this wonderful universe? Do we live merely for ourselves? Is there something more for us to do? The Hawaiians resonated with that kind of saying. Um, we all have a place in the world. The Kumulipo, which is a Hawa the Hawaiian uh, creation story, the Kumulipo shows we're all related. We're related to the plants, related to the animals on the ground. We're related to it all. So this was the framework and this was really funny to me. I saw many differences in the way they were teaching and, and called it Montessori and what I knew as Montessori. But they said, the teaching methods, everything works. Practical life is awesome because it's right up the alley with Hawaiian traditions. And you know, Hawaiian was not a written language. And so the techniques in Montessori math and English and science kind of bring the Hawaiian traditions into the 20th century kind of thing. And the kids love it because it's all hands-on. The Hawaiian immersion kids like it. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And she's still teaching in a Hawaiian language immersion school. That led to this research. So I'm just gonna pause for a minute and just like catch my breath. So you can see that there's a lot of context that led to this science curriculum. They were trying to figure out how do we get our kids to pass the science content standards? You remember when those came into being? The Hawaiian kids were like at the bottom of the pack, like every other indigenous group in the in the United States. They were in the bottom percentages of passing those content standards. And they the charter school was going to be in danger of losing its charter if the kids' scores didn't go up. That was the driving problem. And, and it's fundamentally a homeschool mismatch. Um, what happens at home, the values, the goals are very different than what happens in conventional schooling. So the point of these immersion schools was to help kids achieve better academically while not losing sight of their own language and culture. In fact, privileging that. So that sense of pride 
and I am somebody, we will survive. That's a quote that somebody told me I'll never forget. Her nephew told her that after he went to a Hawaiian cultural-based school. Auntie, I was just thinking, we will survive. And it just like gives me chicken skin still to think that that's the power these kinds of programs can have. So the idea of cultural restorative uh, education is this, this is like a picture from uh, the, the school where I did the, the work. Uh, these kids were took like little seed pods and they were ma making their names and writing Hawaiian words on the sidewalk. So that's an example of how this overlap of the Hawaiian culture and English and Hawaiian language. This is a school, Keikula, this uh, O Samuel M. Kamakau. Um, the goal is to perpetuate the language and culture of Hawaii. So the challenge was to create this bridge between Hawaiian and Western scientific perspectives through this inquiry-based um, science curriculum. And, and the fact is they needed to teach Eurocentric um, science content because that's what the science content standards were based on. So they, they had to do both. And they didn't really know enough about teach, even teaching science in Hawaiian. There's no such thing as science in Hawaiian. So they had to figure that out. They had to figure out what's called science and how to learn more about what's called science. So it was, that was the first part. Um, and so, then they had this challenge then is how do we create a curriculum when we don't really know um, how to do this? So they thought they would start with what they'd learned in their classes, uh, but we were, they were gonna make it their own. So the process says, okay, we have a need. We need to start this science curriculum. We need to get our kids to pass the tests, but we want it to be honoring our language, our culture. They wanted to go visit schools to find out what other schools, like English speaking schools, were doing in terms of inquiry based work, because they wanted to do that too. And then we got together and they talked and they reflected. We got, they decided, they, they attended workshops about inquiry based work. And then they decided they wanted their own course. So we pulled together a graduate level course on how do you do inquiry based work. And we brought some experts in the Hawaiian culture in who were maybe more science-based. And they learned, they talked and reflected in this course. And while they were in the course in the summer, I taught them a framework that they had learned briefly in one of their classes. And we've really honed in on it as being reflective of what they wanted. And then we had time to work together so that they created these, they, they figured out a framework and then they figured out what they, how to get started. And then they brought in the children and they asked the children, what do you wanna learn about the universe? Okay. So what they decided, what they came up with was using their Hawaiian creation chant because they saw that it was very similar to the big bang theory. And they used that to integrate all their science content. That was a kind of integrating device. And then they decided to break their curriculum into four quarters. And the quarters would have four themes. One was the universe. And this corresponds with what Montessori talked about with what she called her cosmic curriculum. So this worked for them, but they shifted it into their own perspective using the Kumulipo. The universe, the story of the coming of the universe. Okay? The story of the coming of the earth or the creation of the earth, or the earth. The story of the coming of plants and animals, or plants and animals and their relationship to the earth and the universe, and the story of people. And then we used a framework to get to the nitty gritty of how do you teach this? And we looked at, so let's, I won't go. So this is the order. They started with the story of creation, story of the earth, life on earth, uh, people on earth. And the Kumulipo was, the Kumulipo story is organized in exactly this way. So it worked really well because they could see how to fit the Western science into this framework. And they all knew the Kumulipo. And then I had 
I taught them this framework that I learned in my Montessori training. I don't think all Montessori programs use this, but it's based loosely on this on this cosmic curriculum. So you could take any topic that you're interested in learning, the sun, for example, the constellations, the um, Big Bang Theory, um, black holes. Those were the things that kids said they wanted to learn in the different grades. And you look then at that thing from its history, its origin story. So how do, how old has the sun might be a question. And you ask the kids, so you might tell a story and then you might ask the children what more they wanna know about the sun. And then the geographical question perspective has to do with place. Well, where is the sun in the universe and where is it in relationship to us? Because you're teaching kids, right? And then that brings you into the solar system. You see how this all becomes interconnected. This gives you a framework to get all the sciences in to your teaching through this topic of wonder. And then what I call the scientific perspective is this idea of you look at the whole and then you break, which is what scientists do. You look at the whole, you say, hmm, I wonder about that. And you break it, you analyze it. You break it into its parts and you name those parts. Scientific perspective, synthesis, analysis, synthesis, whole parts, whole. They liked that way of looking at teaching science because that's a very Hawaiian way of looking at teaching. Start with the whole, look at all its parts, and then look at, and then from knowing those parts, you get a broader picture of the whole. You understand that whole better because of your investigation into its parts. The cultural perspective is about how people have interacted with this topic of wonder. They said, we don't need the cultural perspective. We're all about culture. So they got rid of that. They were embedded in culture. And then the fi final one, I had started out as the ecological perspective. They shifted that to the inner, how everything, how this topic of wonder is interconnected. It's part in the whole. Okay, and that made total sense to them. For my non-Hawaiian students, I would have talked about the ecological perspective, how this thing fits into an ecosystem, if it's a plant or an animal. Okay, so they started with an initial activity that would engage all of the children, this is preschool, remember, all the way through sixth grade, engaging their senses, and they figured out what they wanted to, like they went outside and they looked at the night sky, for example. And then the teachers modeled how to think like scientists and told the kids they were gonna be scientists. They told the littles that they're gonna be junior scientists. And the, they, what do scientists do? They're curious. They notice things. They wanna find the answers to things. Scientists use tools to learn more, right? This is what, they, we simplified it, I'm sure. And then, then scientists investigate and they take notes and they draw, they record what they're, what they're learning. And then they share what they learn with other people. And so the teachers had that also big picture framework in the way they organized the lessons. So they taught the basics of safety. So when the kids were gonna go out and look at the, the you know, don't look directly at the sun, for example. And then they noticed what the kids were interested in and the teachers and the kids together decided what was gonna be their topic of wonder for that first quarter, which is the universe. And then the final thing that they said that, that scientists do is they tell their story. So Carl Sagan, right? He was a great storyteller, a scientist. He said, the cosmos is within us. We are made of star stuff. We are a way for the universe to know itself, okay? So that's, our framework for how they were gonna approach helping the kids to see themselves as scientists in their own context, in their cultural context. So we integrated literacy and the scientists. This is a picture of the kinders um, doing a timeline and matching words. There were This was the synthesis analysis, right? Matching and learning the words in Hawaiian for all of these parts of, I don't know what it is right now, I'm sorry, it's been a really long time, but you can see how engaged the kids are. They loved it. Um, and it was matching, so it was very developmentally appropriate. This is another, the kinders were learning about the sun, so they learned about 
the name for the sun and what the Hawaiian language immersion teachers realized is they didn't know any Hawaiian words for the inside of the sun because it wasn't a Hawaiian concept. So they learned both the English concept and the English words so they could task the content standards. And then they talked about it from a Hawaiian perspective as well. So this is something you probably see in every kindergarten classroom, right? Like the parts of the sun. i be honest, I can't tell you what they are right now, but the kindergartners did. Um, and this then is kindergartners always want to know who's going to take care of me. So the teachers frame this, which is very also culturally appropriate, how the sun takes care of them. One way the sun takes care of them is it evaporates ocean water with its heat. And then the ocean water leaves behind salt. And that salt can dry fish, which means that we can say we can preserve fish. And that helps us to live because we eat fish. So it was very culturally appropriate and it was also appropriate for the kinder. So they they put out salt water on some kind of um, stone something and saw the, the water evaporate over time and the salt was left behind. And then the whole school took the salt that the kinders had evaporated and they dried the fish. And then they at the end of their work, they had a celebration with this fish that the kinders had helped dry. Um, makahana kaike means one learns by working, one learns by doing hands-on learning. And that was that was a, that's an example of a teaching strategy that is was one of the that was shared. Okay. Uh, so these are just some other pictures of the kindergartners. This was something she learned from her monitor. Sorry, this was a teacher, um, Maya Hila Hila. She had blown up a balloon, and I would say it's probably not very, it, we wouldn't do that anymore, but she had put um, something like glitter inside the balloon. She'd blown up the balloon and then popped it, and all the glitter flew out like the Big Bang. You know? <laughs> and and this, um, so she was getting ready to do it, and this is when she did it. You see this kid like, what? So it was, and, and again, this was like in 2008. I don't think we, she, we would do that anymore. This was the um, uh, drawings that some of the kindergartners made and their beginning writing. Um, this was um, Hoku means star. So as they were learning about the sun, they also learned about other things about the universe. This was the first and second graders who wanted to know about the, um, the Big Bang Theory for some reason. And this was their uh, representation the children's representations of what that looked like from a Hawaiian perspective. Interesting, huh? The artwork to me is beautiful. So I learned that art is an integral part of science. It's a way to express beautifully what you're learning. And you see all the words in all of these. So they were learning their Hawaiian words as well. Um, and then this was the third and fourth graders. This teacher was hilarious because she started out being a very high control teacher who had the problem of the Hawaiian belief is that you have to have kids, let kids do their own thing. So she had a really hard time with that at first. Um, and I'll get back to that. But these kids were learning about the solar system and the constellations. You see, this is Ursula Minor, but it's also got a Hawaiian name. The Hawaiians use the stars to navigate from Tahiti to all over the place, including to Hawaii, they were the, probably had the most advanced navigation by the stars understanding of any people in the world at that time. They navigated entirely by the stars. So they had to have deep scientific knowledge of the seasons, of how the uh, constellations turned in the sky, when they could leave, when they couldn't leave, all of that. So these are just examples, again, of the kids doing activities that relate to um, their particular class project. So they did that. It was great. The teachers were excited. They loved it. And then they moved in the second quarter to exploring um, the earth. And they learned about the volcanoes, the words for all the parts of the volcano. That's an example of that third like um, scientific perspective. Um, they learned about the islands and they made maps of the islands um, because that's their place and how islands get formed. 
this was a, some artwork that they did that was fundamentally about their drawings of the islands, which I think is extremely beautiful. And this was the third and fourth graders. And then this was when they started looking at the plants. And this was, again, that very beautiful painting. I don't know if it's painting or maybe it's pencil. It's pencil, I think. It, it's just beautiful. These are the hands of the parents. You can see how they get that, con that. So they were learning about plants, but in a Hawaiian context, animals in a Hawaiian context. One of the things that's really interesting for Hawaiians is that, and then they would do the hands-on out working in the tarot and then learning about the parts of the plants. So Western Hawaiian, learning the names of all the parts. The Hawaiians have a very interesting way of classifying um, life. They don't classify it in terms of botany and zoology and then all the subclassifications. They classify it in the sense of land and water. So every land creature, any 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 land living thing, plant or animal, has a counterpart in the ocean. And that's what the kids learned. So they learned both. They learned the botany and zoology and, and to take things apart in that way. And they also learned the Hawaiian way of classification. I didn't even know there was another way to classify. So this was instructive for me too. Um, and then they told their story. So, and this was the story. So they, the teachers put together books that were pictures of what the kids learned at the different grade levels. They give those, they gave those books to the families as part of their um, ho'olaulea, their celebration of learning, where they invited parents to uh, come and see what they had learned, which is because that's what scientists do. Scientists share their work publicly, right? And um, and parents were blown away because we have to, there was a hundred years of suppression of the Hawaiian language and culture. The parents were growing, had grown up in the era of you can't speak Hawaiian or you'll get you'll get like sent to the principal's office. So for them to see what their kids were learning. One, a teacher told me that one of her parents was in tears looking at these, the, the artwork and the work that the children had done. And she said, this, re I'll, I'll, it's like, she said, this reminds me of what my grandmother, my tutu used to tell me as stories. She said, I'm so glad my son is able to learn this. You see that sense of pride and like, we are somebody, we will be somebody. That's what this project did for the kids. And for the teachers, because they didn't know this before they started. They learned along with the teachers. They brought in experts. But this framework gave them the freedom to do that. Their kumulipo, and then looking at their topic with it through this really easy to remember five perspectives. Once you get in your head, you can never leave it. It never leaves your head. And then they were able to do all their regular things that the Department of Education required in terms of standards and making sure that what the kids were learning was also gonna meet those standards. But they did it from the backwards way in. So this is the lessons I learned, the teachers learned. They learned that they could bridge these two worlds. They could send kids on who could be bilingual and bicultural and fit in anywhere. They could fit in in Harvard, Harvard. They could fit in in the tarot patch. They could do the both and, and that was very exciting. The teachers felt very successful. They didn't think they could teach science. They were like the students. They didn't think they could be, they didn't like science. They were scared of it. They found out they liked it and they could do it. They also found out that they could observe and follow the students. They didn't have to be the, te the sage on the stage. And they finally found out that this connected families to their past. This is the teacher. Remember I said she was so like tight and she wanted to run everything and she didn't give kids any. She said that. I don't give them any latitude. Ali'i. This is what she said at the end in a reflection. Essentially, it is my job to initiate the first key experience. However, once the seed is planted, I become the resource rather than an expert. 
The objective of this type of curriculum is to allow the students to tell their own story. The relevance of content to their own lives allows the novice student to become the expert, thus creating the transfer of knowledge that is needed for learning to take place. This is what she learned through this work that she did. I blew my mind. And then I'm wrapping up here. This was from the uh, a first grader. So we asked, the, the teachers interviewed the students and said, well, what did you think about doing this? I'm gonna make my best effort to do this in Hawaiian and English. I, I'm not a native Hawaiian speaker by any means, Kono e malama ia papahana au moku i hike ke ola kau mau moopuna. We must care for Papa Hana mau Hana nao moku, Earth Mother, so that my grandchildren can live. From a first grader. Pili kako a pau a pono kako ke kahi e kikahi. There is a relationship between all of us, sky, earth, people, plants, and animals in some way, and we all need each other. This is a fifth grader. When I moved to California, I didn't think I would do this work again. Um, but what kept coming up for me was we have got, like I was being dragged by my neck hairs, we have got to teach kids to fall in love with the earth and take care of it. We've got to teach kids to be, who want to be scientists. And that's what led to me doing a variety of this work um, here where I'm living now. The challenges, it's hard to do this work because it's very high level work. That class I took on the summer made all the difference. And that was a lot of time that they, they, if you don't have release time for teachers, this is never, it can't work. The teachers found that they could learn alongside their students. They didn't have to be the experts ahead of time. And they, one of their big challenges was that they didn't have, there weren't enough words in the Hawaiian language because it had been suppressed for the hundred years that scientific, um, that science had progressed. For example, they didn't have a Hawaiian word for a light switch. So they had to make up words and then they had to get the words approved. It was quite challenging. So in conclusion, this is what this, this is the conclusions out of this study. Um, I would argue that culture-based learning provides a foundation, can provide a foundation, should for by, be the foundation for children's understanding of state standards. It is possible to take early childhood principles. Remember my background is early childhood, but these were K-3 teachers. It worked. We took these principles of hands-on learning right into that K-3 setting with a teacher who said, I don't do that at the beginning. And at the end, she was all about it. A science-based inquiry curriculum is motivating to the kids and the teachers. Now ours was outdoor, it was nature-based, right? The natural world, and it was academically rigorous. It, bring, it brings validity to traditional or indigenous stories and, perfect, and perspectives. And now what I'm learning is that it can bring validity to the families who hear it's mostly Latinx, like the, the grandparents' stories are showing up in the work we're doing here. And those stories usually don't come to school. So I'm feeling really happy that that's, I'm seeing that happen here. This is what a fifth grader said when somebody asked her how she felt after finishing her project. She said it in Hawaiian, um, but she said, I feel like a shining star in the universe. And it was just so like, so good. Um, so I, I, um, I would love to, by the way, have a copy of that recording. <laughs> I'll probably be mortified, but I would love to have it. So I'm gonna say what the Hawaiians say when they're very, very thankful. Mahalo, mahalo, mahalo. It has been my great honor to share this. So I'm gonna stop sharing and we've got a few minutes. I need to leave be close to 8.30 because I have a nine o'clock class to teach this morning. <laughs> I have to change my, um, change my yeah. frame of reference. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say mahalo, 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 Sherry, for being with <laughs> us today. And it was such a powerful talk. And my heart, yeah, brings my memory back in Hawaii. Oh, it probably does, right? Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I remember my Kumu when I was trying to learn how to grow taro, you know, and he said, you have to uh, grow taro, the root, when the full is, mo uh, the moon is full, you know, at the full moon, there's a special, you know, way they do things. Yeah, but anyway, so much. So, yeah, there's so, so much I didn't even touch on that they did like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's it's amazing. It's amazing. So we're open up for the questions in the audience. Anybody? Well, I have a question. Um, this was fascinating, Sherry. Thank you so much. Um, and um, it, it's really, it, it just really showcases how you uh, you need to translate things to, um, you know, where kids are and and their world. And I wonder if um, you have been able to apply this to other um, communities um, other than the Hawaii now that you're in California, or have you been able to see this be applied to other um, communities and, and um, representations that the kids may bring? Uh, it was, it took a minute because I had to kind of figure out, I hadn't been in California in 35 years. So it was like, it was a minute. I would say it happened by accident. I was very lucky. I was at a meeting and the Dean had some money like for a small like project. It was my first meeting and I'd vowed to say nothing. And she was saying, who has any ideas for funding? And the person who had kind of like wanted me to come work there was like, looked at it, so Cher, what do you think? And um, so I just leaned back on this and what I've been doing for about the last seven years is working with preschools in this area. It's primarily Latinx kids. And the schools I'm working with are primarily low income. And so it's it's a similar demographic in that in the sense of underrepresented in the sciences. And probably, and the teachers are afraid to teach science. So that mm -hmm. felt very comfortable. And I ended, I, what I did is I ended up teaching a class and bringing my students to a school that said, yeah, you can come to our school. The teachers just observed what we were doing. It was the same idea, but without the Kumulipo, that five-pronged framework, the topic of wonder, that's what we did. The teacher said, can you come and teach this to us? So that was my opening. And that turned, and I said, yeah, as long as I can make it a research project, because, <laughs> you know, research. And they said, that's fine. And so we worked together for about two years and we were getting ready to go into a third year and then COVID hit and everything just fell apart in the world of early childhood. I would say until this year, it was a mess. It's a mess. That along with universal pre-kindergarten, the field is kind of imploding on itself. Mm -hmm. So I didn't do anything, but I worked for about three years. And so I would call these like pilot studies, but I found the same thing happening kids like what we're like, talking about being scientists being really really interested in we had a project on worms that lasted for a year like <laughs> the kids could, and the teachers and we taught the teachers were teaching both spanish and english um scientific terms right and then the teachers discovered that worms also don't don't have only English and Spanish like worms for the parts of the worm. That was a mystery. That was very mysterious to everybody what the parts of the worm were. And then they found out they're also in Latin. So that was pretty fun. Um, so it's exactly that same framework. You look at the history, the, the time. The, and I was it's I start with a creation story. What I'd loved, and I added another piece, which is some teaching strategies from. Um, that also from the University of Hawaii, the Center for Research on Diversity, Equity, and Education. This was about a 30 or 40 year study, it was longitudinal all over the United States, looking at what teaching strategies work best for kids um, from exactly these kind of underrepresented, under, um, under resourced neighborhoods. And so I added that in kind of as an afterthought and the teachers said, we love this because this helps us with, they've got to use the class and the California state standards in these, the lower income schools have state funding. So they are as bound to state standards as the Hawaiian teachers were. 
So this they found to be very helpful. Um, what, um, what I learned most recently, which is really interesting, is that the with this particular group, the teacher self-esteem, especially the assistant teachers, their self-esteem goes through the roof because they feel like they know how to do this. They can do this. They don't feel afraid of teaching science. And the other thing I learned, which is very surprising, that I haven't been able to investigate, two things I haven't been able to, why the teachers think that this helps them with their standards. I don't know what that means. I don't know why they think that's true. I don't even know how to think about how to ask yet. So that's my next thing. The other thing is that teachers would tell me that like they would have kids like being outdoors, working in this project, more, for these guys, it's been more the garden or like some, like the worms, something they found in the play yard. No. And they say it, it changes the atmosphere of their social life in the classroom. The kids get along better with one another when they're doing this work. So that's, so I've been able, I have not been able to work with the local tribes here. It's very, very difficult. I probably would have to have some accident of being invited. You have to be invited. I'm an outsider. There's no reason to trust me, right? So I would love to share this, but the work I'm doing now is 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 good, and it can keep me busy till I retire, <laughs> which will be sooner rather than later. <laughs> so, thank you. Long answer to your question. Yeah. No, nope, it's wonderful. Yeah. So, and I probably have to go in a minute here because mm -hmm. I've got to like turn my head around and get into teaching early childhood approaches. So thank you. I appreciate it. And I'm going to say aloha, aloha and mahalo nui noa. Thank you, Sherry. Sure. We appreciate thank it. You. I will send you the recording. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.